Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Dunkel, and I am the Senior Clinical Director for Higher Education at the Jet Foundation. And I'm just waiting for uh, my colleagues to turn on their camera and, and their microphones. So Sophia and Tia, hi. Um, welcome to the panel on supporting student mental health, creating trauma-informed communities of care on campuses. Um, we're really excited to be here. I want to first off uh, thank Dr. Marlene Trump uh, for her leadership uh, and um, thoughtfulness that's gone into the launch pad and this digital summit. Uh, she reached out to me uh, a couple months ago and asked me uh, through an email if I would be willing to participate. And I immediately didn't even think, I said, absolutely, tell me when and where, and I'll be there. Uh, because this is such an important, these issues are such important topics. Um, and I was really drawn to her desire to really um, provide action steps for participants who are going to be part of this digital summit. So I'm very excited to be a part of this. And I want to thank her and her colleagues and staff at Boise State University. Um, and I hope that uh, all of you are, the participants in this digital summit are getting a lot out of this. And we hope to be able to hopefully provide you all some action steps as well. Um, I am gonna ask, uh, the, the other thing when I decided to do this, um, I thought about who could I get to do this with me? And it, that didn't take long either. And I thought of the two great colleagues here for whom I have a great deal of respect and really uh, value their perspectives. And I'm gonna ask them to each introduce themselves, tell them who they are and uh, their affiliation and maybe a little bit about their background. Um, so. Uh, Tia, would you like to go first? Sure, thank you, John, for inviting me to join this panel. And Sophia, it's always good to see you as well. So I'm looking forward to our conversation. And thank you to Dr. Trump for inviting us as well to be part of this and to her wonderful staff for their preparation for today. I am Tia McNair, I serve as the Vice President for Diversity, Equity and Student Success and the Executive Director for the Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Campus Centers at the Association of American Colleges and Universities in Washington, DC. And I have been engaged with the Jed Foundation on a couple of panels this summer, really focusing in on obviously mental health and well-being. But for our perspective at AAC, you will be talking about the work for the Truth and Racial Healing Transformation Campus Centers and our focus on racial healing circles. So I'm Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Tia. Sophia. Hi, thank you so much. I'm going to echo everybody's thank you that for Dr. Trump putting this together for, for everyone because it's an important topic. And any excuse I have to partner with my colleagues, uh, Dr. John Dunkel and Dr. Tia Brown McNair, is always a privilege. Um, so, uh, thing about me is I'm the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at the Jed Foundation. I have been with Jed for two years. Before that, I was in higher education for. 24 years working in, high, in student affairs and um, teaching as a faculty member. And my previous position right before this one was Associate Vice President and Dean of Students at Hofstra University. Uh, and just over years hearing and listening to students' needs, um, really thinking about it from a well being and mental health perspective brought me to bed, specifically the equity and mental health framework and how we can. Um, rethink the way that we provide support for students. So I'm thrilled to be part of this conversation and anything we can do to make life better for students to help them be successful, I'm on board. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Tia. Um, so as I said, I'm John Dunkel. I'm the Senior Clinical Director at the Jet Foundation. I've been here six months. And prior to that, I was at an institution for higher education for 25 years um, as a mental health professional. I'm a psychologist by training. Um, and I was the director of the Counseling Center for 15 years at Northwestern University. Um, so uh, the issues we're going to talk about today are something that's been on my mind for a long time. Um, and whenever I do talks on things like trauma, which is going to be a part of our focus here today, um, I always think about what we hear about with our students and in, in terms of trigger warnings. And, and you never know where people come from, their walk of lives, their background, their experiences. And as we talk about these issues today, uh, if you're feeling that you need to take time for yourself, that they're potentially triggering, please do that. Take time for yourself, support yourself. Um, and, and hopefully you'll be able to rejoin us if you need to step away. So I just wanna say that um, in the interest of making sure we take care of ourselves. 
Um, for those who are not familiar with the JET Foundation, the JET Foundation's mission is really to help campuses develop systems, policies, and programs that promote mental health and well being of students, um, as well as suicide prevention. Um, what we do essentially is we help uh, campuses strategically create what I call communities of caring. Um, and we also uh, provide programming uh, for campuses as well as students so that as they navigate their mental health challenges um, and so that they are equipped uh, to navigate them. Uh, we try to educate communities and support the emotional well being in general in higher education. Um, how do we do that? Well, uh, at JED, we really, we really uh, go and work with campuses to develop uh, strategic plans around um, various what we call domains that we know are based on research and data uh, correlated to mental health and well being of our students and our campus communities. Three things I would say that are fundamental principles uh, that are important um, uh, when you think about helping a campus develop these strategic plans. First of all, um, that you have to see mental health on a continuum, just like physical health. That um, just because someone does not have a physical illness doesn't mean they're necessarily physically healthy. It's the same thing with mental health. And so if you can think of our mental health along a continuum, that helps us to think about different ways that we can address the mental health of our students. Uh, we talked about the strategic planning process. That's another part of creating a community of care that it has to really be thoughtful, intentional, and involve uh, many campus uh, partners, uh, including students, faculty, and staff to really create a sustainable uh, strategic plan around mental health, uh, well-being, and suicide prevention. And finally, every campus member has a role and responsibility in this community of care. It's not just the counseling center, if you have a counseling center or health service professionals, it is the whole community. And if you can look at it that way, uh, it can really make a big difference in terms of how you approach it. Everyone plays a role in the mental health and well-being and suicide prevention on a campus. As I said, in working in higher education for 25 years, um, I know firsthand, especially from a counseling center perspective, what students were dealing with even before COVID in this last year, 2020, basically. And we know that anxiety, stress, depression, were all on the rise, suicidal ideation. Well, we also know um, as we've been now eight months or so into the pandemic, um, that uh, anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation are up even more. And so this is a very timely program to really be thinking about what we can do and what might be leading to these increases. Um, in the normal course of things, uh, if you can think about it that way, we already were concerned about mental health issues and certainly college presidents, it's on their minds. Survey after survey shows that either the first or second um, issue that's on their mind is that of mental health of students as well as faculty and staff. And that's another important uh, point that I want to make here. While we are going to be focusing on community of care and we think about students, this also has an impact on the faculty and staff um, who are on our campuses. They have also experienced um, over the last eight months the various um, challenges and stressors that we have experienced here in the United States as well as around the world. So we need to think about this as a campus issue, not just a student, but all, all different constituents on our campuses. So it's, it's true in the last eight to nine months or so, we have been hit by a wave of public health and other societal challenges that have weighed heavily on our campus communities. As you said, the COVID-19 pandemic has turned our world upside down and has disproportionately affected uh, people of color due to inequities in healthcare and racism. Additionally, police brutality uh, against Black Americans has been graphically demonstrated in the media by protests across the country, uh, accompanied by protests across the country. Furthermore, xenophobia has negatively impacted many Asian Asian Americans who have been blamed wrongfully by some for, for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, financial impact, of course, of the virus has been devastating with millions of people losing their jobs uh, and needing to apply for unemployment. As we go forward and think about a new launch pad, which is the topic of this program uh, for students and our community, we need to think about all of these stressors that have really weighed 
on various in various ways for for our campus uh, community members. And some of them have been very traumatic. And so we need to think about moving forward from a trauma-informed perspective. In this way, we can more fully support our students, our faculty and staff, as they work through these experiences of anxiety, pain and trauma toward healing. In short, it has been emotionally and physically exhausting for our campus students, faculty and staff. Who knows what, um, th what things will look like in six months as hopefully we start to emerge from the pandemic with vaccinations coming out. How will it look on the other side for higher education? That's the question. We do not know at this point. In 2014, uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which is under the United States um, Health and Human Services Department, uh, put out a great document on trauma and trauma-informed approaches, which was prepared by their Trauma and Justice uh, Strategic Initiative. I'm gonna ask if it hasn't been put in the chat to please put it in there um, and make it available for the participants. I think it's also, if it's not already in the uh, Launchpad library, it, it will be. It's a great document that really, um, while it wasn't written specifically for higher education, it is very applicable to higher education. And they described in there um, what is meant by trauma. And trauma uh, can come in many forms. And it can be a single traumatic event. It can be a series of events that maybe have occurred over decades or more. Uh, it could be direct trauma that someone's experienced. It could be trauma that uh, someone may experience uh, vicariously from someone they know, um, for example. Racial trauma is also another experience. Intergenerational trauma. We know a lot more about trauma and um, we're educating uh, ourselves about it. And we need to if we have it. And I would highly encourage you to take a look at uh, that document because it really does provide a nice overview of, of what we mean by trauma and trauma informed. Knowing what our campus constituents have gone through over the last eight months or so, we really need to think about what what some of their experiences have been and think about what are symptoms of silence, what are symptoms of trauma? So realizing what it is, what it looks like, um, and then how do we respond by fully integrating a knowledge about trauma into our policies, procedures, and practices? And that's where we really get into the detail of, of what it means to be a trauma-informed institution um, so that we provide support for our students, faculty, and staff. Having just laid that very brief um, background, I'm gonna to turn to our uh, panelists uh, now and ask them to sort of respond to what are you, what have you seen in your role um, in hearing from campuses in terms of uh, trends, in terms of trauma uh, responses, reactions, and what are some potential signs of trauma that campuses can think about to recognize, when you think about the recognition of it is a key part of, of the work. Um, and so maybe we'll start with uh, Sophia, would that work, Sophia? Sure, um, well, one thing that's coming to mind is just what this year has been, right? So many campuses over the summer um, have been putting out really strongly worded statements around their commitment to diversity and inclusion, racial equity and justice, and there's language that has been used by campus presidents and, and senior leadership that even students are like, wow, they mean it this time. They're serious about the way that they want to support uh, marginalized student identities and um, make sure that they're saying it publicly. One thing that I think about when I connect to trauma is the idea that students are going, where have you been? I've been saying this is an important topic. Why did we wait until um, we have to continuously see the disparities that our communities are dealing with from a health, public health perspective, from a mental health perspective, from a um, violence and, and you know, real um, videotaped evidence of injustice in our, in our systems. Um, so students are wondering, okay, that's great that you're um, 
making sure that say that your commitments are there and it's on your website, but what were, what are the receipts as the young people would say? What are you doing? What are the actions you're taking? What is the funding that you've provided? What additional um, resources are you creating? And I know that it's been a really tough year just anyway, right? With the um, campuses needing to shift to online and make major um, resource allocation to different modes of learning and different modes of engagement. So one thing that I, I've also thought about is we partnered, the Jed Foundation partnered with the C Fund to uh, implement a pilot implementation of the equity and mental framework. And if um, you have never seen the equity and mental framework, you can get it on www.equityandmentalhealth.org. We can put it in the chat so you can check it out. But they were 10 actionable recommendations to help campuses really think about how to um, make the well being and mental health a priority for your campuses, for students of color and other marginalized identities, making sure you're getting student feedback and engaging them, making sure you're recruiting and retaining and training um, faculty, staff, and administrators that can respond to, to student needs, creating a dedicated role. I can go, I can go on and you can probably see them. Um, but basically, what we've learned in that implementation process the last two years with 18 schools across the United States is that um, it was a tough time even before the pandemic hit. It was a tough time before we started having much more public and national conversation and international conversations around racial justice. But the thing that is really standing out is the idea of leadership commitment and what students' expectations are and what they wanna see. Also, whether or not faculty are able to, now that they many of them are the touch point for students, if they're not able to go see their directors of student life, their VPs of student affairs and their, you know, people that they're used to seeing in person and going just to drop in to, to check out, you know, how are things going and just get support. Their faculty are it for many of them. So they're wondering, okay, how can faculty support me better? What can they be doing more of? And it's become clearer. So those are just two things that I think about senior leadership commitment, faculty training and faculty support um, that is really helpful and them understanding what challenges students have with their lack of resources or, or limited resources and home life challenges that get in the way of them completing their assignments. Um, I can go on, but those are just a few and I'm sure we'll keep talking, but it's been interesting just to see that and the way that trauma has played out and how even faculty and staff are, are having a hard time trying to figure it out. How do we pivot to support when you're trying to do it in a different mode than what you're used to? Thanks, Sophia. Yeah, do you want to share? So I just want to say I agree with everything that Sophia just said, but that's not surprising because I always agree with Sophia. So I think that she's brilliant. Um, definitely um, with this focus, our students want us to be authentic and they want us to react and they want us to respond and be responsive to their needs. But at the same time, we have to think critically about how our institutions build the capacity to prepare racial trauma-informed leaders and educators. And I think that's something that we struggle with. And unfortunately, what happens is that burden falls on, or that responsibility falls on a certain group of people on campus. And those people feeling as if they're the only ones that can respond, and they're often the, the educators that look like the students and have shared experiences. We need to do a better job in higher education of figuring out how we're going to prepare. So, so first, let's, let's just go back, John, to what you were saying, the definition of trauma. And I think it's important for us to realize that there are so many different variations of how trauma manifests itself for different people. And we need to acknowledge that and respect that it is different for a lot of people. It's not gonna be the same. So we shouldn't be, the get, you know, be judging what is traumatic for some and not traumatic for others. And I think that's something that we need to, to critically understand. I also think that we need to be honest about our inability to address and support certain some students and then figure out ways and strategies for us to actually build as we talked about that capacity to do so. And I think that that is something that we as higher education leaders need to understand and not try to have, as we talked about, Sophia, as you mentioned, the quick fix or the fix that we think that we normally go to. Let's get a committee. Let's do it, that, you know, let's make a plan. Let's do this. And then our students are like, okay, that's the same thing that you've been doing. 
And even our peers are saying that's the same thing you're doing because we got to be honest too. It's not just our students who are experiencing trauma. It's the people who are part of our community that are experiencing trauma. And that's why the, um, the series that's in Inside Higher Ed, I think is so powerful about the black experience in higher education, talking and hearing from educators, from faculty about their dealing with trauma in hiring and tenure and promotion and just being able to stay and to I mean, be retained as faculty members and their interactions with their own peers. And I think we just have to be expansive in understanding that our institution and many of our institutions perpetuate racialized practices and we need to develop systems for actually identifying it and dealing with it in a way that is going to prioritize that deep communication, that empathy, that deep listening. And as we talk about at ACU, that healing process so that we can transform. And we should say we're transforming, not just transform because it's an ongoing process. I, I think that's a great point, um, Tia, the, the, that you know this is something that is a process. It's not necessarily an outcome. You get there and you're done. It's something that we need to constantly monitor and adjust as necessary and listen to the feedback and, and, and follow, you know, the trends and whatnot. You know, I was listening um, to an interview the other day uh, from a football coach, actually a college football coach, and I found it very insightful. He was talking about how teams um, that are struggling that the first uh, inclination is maybe to blame the players or to blame someone. And he, he used the analogy of you need to look under the hood. You need to dig deeper. And a lot of times that I would encourage campuses to think about is that, you know, uh, it's very easy to get frustrated, to get exasperated um, with students, faculty and staff around things. But if you think and think deeper about what might they might be experiencing and what has happened in the last um, several months and even before that, it's something much deeper. And usually you can dig into possibly trauma. Trauma is such, a, I think, a loaded word for some people. I'm wondering if you both have specific examples for how it might look uh, on a campus. What would, what would be um, one way where, you know, you think about, um, wow, that's, 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 a, that's something bigger. That's something we need to really think about that. I can think of a couple, but I'm wondering if you both have maybe one or two you might share. Whoever would like to go. Huh. Um, I guess I would say not underestimating the power of communities and encouraging that. Um, we have one of the schools that we worked at with, with the Equity Mental Framework had a um, Black women's leadership group that would meet and discuss just what is life like? What do you need to support each other? And when they um, had to go remote, they were trying to figure it out. How do we still create this authentic and real experience that was supposed to only be in person. And what they found is they did pivot to a Zoom environment and found that it was just as affirming. They were still having authentic conversations about hair and how to do what you have to do and you know, without have, being able to go to beauty salons. And, just, and I know that sounds so trite, right? Oh, who's talking about hair? Well, Black women are. <laughs> and if that's what they need to talk about to kind of just feel real and authentic when they're not feeling that in their classroom, when they're kind of feeling not connected or, or just not, not involved, um, then those are the spaces that some of these counseling centers and student life departments are creating. So I, I would say that's one that really stands out because it was more than one school that created those environments and then they kept going because the need was still there. And then the thing that ended up happening is that it got expanded. More people could join because those students who were working before and couldn't make it because of the time constraints were still able to engage and and find a way to still connect, even though it was, you know, since it wasn't in person, it was actually easier to do that. So that's one example, those support systems that students might need that you can expand now. Um, and even if we, when we do go back on campus and, and students are engaging in person, figuring out, okay, now that we know that this is possible to still be authentic and, and really create those affirming environments, how do we do that in a more um, expanded way and in ways that can, create even more specialized populations that might need support from one another. So veterans, for example, LGBTQ plus students, like whatever it is, finding that, that opportunity to bring students together. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, I'm going to mention our work on the truth, racial healing and transformation campus centers. And again, it's not the the answer is not the only answer. It is something that we have embraced at the Association of American Colleges and Universities as a key aspect of what we see as a need within our member institutions and within the institutions that we engage with at AAC and U. And TRHT is a national effort that was launched by the Kellogg Foundation. And the visionary and architect of that is Gail Christopher when she was at the Kellogg Foundation. And she's now serving as an advisory you know, board member for us at ACNU. And she also developed what we call the RX racial healing circles. We believe strongly that the goal of TRHT and with our campus centers, we, we have 26 right now, is to jettison the false belief in a hierarchy of human value and to really promote our interconnectedness as human beings. And so how do we go about doing that? And there is a framework that we use. And one of the first things that we encourage all of our campuses to do is to imagine what their communities, and not just their institution, but what their communities would look like, feel like, and be like when there was no longer a false belief in a hierarchy of human value. And how do you get to that vision? Well, you first get to that by understanding the narrative about race at your institution and within your communities. And this is the truth telling part is actually understanding the history of race that has been either been perpetuated by your institution that is shared by, it, by the people who work in your institution and within your community, and then identifying the leverage points for change. And when we are doing this, you're actually looking at, John, as you mentioned earlier, about your policies and your structures and your systems to say, how do we actually are the way we've designed these, how are we perpetuating this hierarchy of human value that has put us into this divide with one another where we're no longer able to engage across differences and, and able to have empathy and to engage with one another in a way where we understand trauma and we understand the impact on our mental, mental and physical well being when our students and our colleagues and our peers experience racism and hate. And, and I'm specifically talking about that because that's the work of TRHT. But we're also looking at this in the bigger picture too. I mean, and you mentioned health equity, which is something that we examine too, because there's a hierarchy of human value, even, and we all know this, even in our health policies, that has caused tra trauma for many of our students, their families, our peers, our colleagues. So we're, we're asking our institutions to not just say, like we talked about earlier, these statements about what we're going to do and how we're going to be an anti-racist institution or how we're going to advance our work on diversity and equity inclusion to be a more expansive and welcoming campus. No, let's actually get down to what it means to identify where racialized practices exist. And let's not only identify them, but let's address them. Let's be truthful about them. I was, um, and John, I mentioned this to you earlier when we were in the prep session, but I was in a session yesterday, not gonna give too much information because I don't wanna give it away where I was. But it was from Nash, I was in get, listening to national leaders talk about the work and uh, dealing with racism and they minimize the importance of healing in this process. And that took me a little back because we cannot get, and I personally believe we can't make progress and we can't get to where we're going to be if we are always gonna be in this confrontational mode and always telling each other what it is that we're doing wrong versus focusing on what we need to do right to move forward. And I think that it's important to be truthful and to be honest about the past injustices that have been done to so many and that continue. But I also think that being able to heal from those traumatic experiences and heal from those impacts is just as important and as critical to our work as a country, as a democracy, as institutions of higher learning where we're seeking to prepare the next generation to be better than we are, to be that launch pad that we're talking about. And, and I think that that's important for us to not see healing and being able to engage in that deep listening and have in that care for one another as a weakness. 
and something that should be minimized. And I, and I, in this conversation yesterday, I was thinking, I feel that that's being minimized. And, and, and again, that's where we box mental health into and that and and that well-being concept we box it into something that that is a sign of weakness and i don't think that that's true i i totally agree and uh you said it better than i ever could and uh you know a couple of other examples concretely that i would give in my experience you know where you never know where um you know traumatic experiences or trauma is is and you know some examples I've been hearing about and seeing are, you know, things like uh, the activism that students are engaging with on campuses to defund campus police and, uh, and other types of things like that. Financial aid offices. Finances have been a huge issue um, uh, in this country. And when students have to go uh, to financial aid and um, address, you know, different issues around uh, their need and whatnot, that could be potentially traumatizing. And, um, because you never know what that stirs up. It could mean that, it, you know, they don't get the money. It's sort of like if their family at home, they, they don't have food on the table or able to uh, pay for their home. Um, and so there's lots of different ways that this, the face of it is on our campuses. Um, you know, I want to move into some, some action steps um, and just, you know, and you sort of talked about some here. And I'm interested in, in if you would share with, um, the participants a little bit about what are maybe three or four uh, action steps that you would recommend for campuses um, as they go forward in this new launch pad and in this launch, doing the launch pad. Uh, Tia, you wanna go first? Sure. So our campuses, the ones that are working with us on TRHT and also engaged in our diversity, equity, inclusion work at ACNU, they have many different strategies, many different things that they're doing to actually address this. And one of them is, is really engaged in the healing process and engaging in having healing circles. But then also it's reimagining the, you know, the curriculum and really thinking about what that looks like at the institution. And how is that curriculum engaging students in those deeper conversations about hierarchy, about power, about privilege, um, where are they falling short? Where is it actually perpetuating those, those misbeliefs uh, within our system? We also are thinking about ways that our institutions are preparing our educators. And, and so again, back to what we said before, you can't just assume that people are going to know how to do this work and how to be prepared to do this work. And I think that many of our institutions are trying to build this capacity in a way that is incremental, but is scaled at the same way, because we know that it can't be relied upon from different or for the same people. Again, collecting and examining the narrative about race and then really trying to develop a plan, a pl an actionable plan to move forward when they have identified ways that racialized practices exist on campus. When they say, okay, we know, for example, like John, you mentioned financial aid, are our students being treated differently uh, based on their race and ethnicity when they enter into our offices? Are we asking more from some than from others? And we've heard this from some of our campuses sharing that information with us. And so all of these aspects and how they're partnering with the community to do this work. And I think that's, Sophia, you mentioned that too, that is so critical and so important. And many are, of our institutions that are working with us, they're not just partnering with the, the community organizations, they're also partnering with K through 12 leaders. And they wanna make sure that the work that they're doing on the campus is having an impact in the K through 12 system. It's not something that just happens in higher education. It is systemic. We know that, it, we know that it's structural. And we have to think about um, ways of embedding these conversations and these actionable items into the way we design and, and present information and share information with students. So those are just a couple of things. Um, I know that many of our institutions are working with churches, they're working with local libraries, they're having conversations with, um, you know, looking at how they even share their history at their institutions and what needs to be acknowledged and redesigned in a way that is more um, expansive and respectful of the communities that they serve. Uh, 
so I'll jump in. Um, and one thing that I heard Tia say that I think is so important to recognize is what we need to do right. So many schools are focused on, they already know the data, they have the information. And uh, I remember going to a talk by Dr. Sean Harper at USC and he was like, how much more data do we need? <laughs> Students have been sharing with us for years what they've needed. We have plenty of data. I mean, we can always collect more, don't get me wrong. Um, but one thing I was thinking about is how that in the how, um, one of the hows is help the helpers. So Tia mentioned before how many staff and faculty are burnt out because they are really trying hard to be that support system for students, but they may not know what the right strategies are and, and at what is their limit and what are the campus resources they need to share. So being sure to include um, people you might not think of in gatekeeper training. So um, we mentioned earlier financial aid um, counselors. I went to one campus and, and we did a mental health talk and they included their financial aid staff because the vice president of student affairs on that campus said, you know, many students who are struggling and trying to make sense of how to afford next year sit in those offices crying and upset. And sometimes they just need someone there to, to give them that support in the moment. And by including these staff members, they're not only acknowledging the secondary trauma that they experienced, they're also recognizing you're part of the help, the short-term help that that student needs. Maybe they don't need to go to the counseling center. Maybe they just need that moment, right? So that's just one example of an actionable thing. Um, another thing is being realistic about what you offer and don't offer. I think we, you know, having been on campuses for over 20 years, I've been at many admission presentations where we promise the world, your student's gonna get so much support. They're gonna get this, they're gonna get that. But then sometimes realizing I think you need to be realistic about what you actually can offer. And that might mean connecting to community resources. That might mean admitting that there is food insecurity and, and other insecurities for students. And the Hope Center has plenty of data around what student needs are. Um, so that, that might mean creating a position like a case manager who can collect information about how to connect students to the resources you might not have on campus. And I know some campuses have not been wanting to um, create a food pantry or support one because you don't want to give the impression that your students are food insecure or don't have the means. But I think there's a different time now where um, there is a need and that is clearly demonstrated with data. And then the last one is to address some of those basic needs. And the idea of basic needs can actually be a little different. Some community colleges I have seen are handing out hotspots to students for Wi-Fi. That's a basic need now. If that is the way you're gonna connect and be successful in your course, then you might need to figure out how to build a laptop program or, or um, tablet, which many campuses have already been doing. Some are, are trendsetters in that. And, you know, I went to Seton Hall where I remembered when they first started the laptop program back in the 90s. Um, so I think if you're not there yet as a campus, really considering that um, and, and figuring out what are the other things that students need to be successful academically, if that means tutoring, if that means online support. So those are my some of the thoughts I, I'm thinking with well-being in general, with basic needs. You know, um, one of the things that um, you both just brought up was, you know, you never know, as I said, you know, this affects faculty and staff um, in all areas. You know, in the 25 years I worked at an institution of higher ed, um, one of the things that always, um, uh, amazed me, I don't know why it amazed me, but it did, um, was the, the, some of the closest relations some students make, particularly undergrads, um, are with the housing and dining staff, the cleaning and dining staff. And I say that because, you know, thinking about um, how they support the students too, and that could be potentially um, vicariously traumatizing to them as well, or even directly. And so thinking about all le levels of the organization is so important um, uh, to make sure that we're supporting um, our campus community members. Um, and one, there's one other thing that I was gonna mention. Um, you know, uh, the other thing that I know in my experience and, and listening to and reading about campuses, especially of late, one of the things that, um, that some may not realize on campuses is that, you know, asking for more information, data, data, you know, getting more data, don't we have enough? That's something I heard from students a lot, you know, focus group after focus group and data after data. And, you know, the, the um, 
I think sometimes the natural response on college campuses is, oh, let's appoint a, let's appoint a task force or let's do a committee or something like that. And while that might be good for some campuses, where there's been data and that everything has been known about what is going on, that could be potentially re-traumatizing to communities to reopen them up again. And because um, it's draining to have to share, it is very draining. Um, and so to be thinking about that as well, that's another way from a trauma informed perspective. Um, I would say my points, my takeaways for, for the participants today is, you know, learn more about trauma informed. Um, that, that article that I shared is, is a very um, helpful, I think, in giving some ideas about ways to intentionally and thoughtfully uh, think about trauma informed services programs and policies. Also think about mental health on a continuum. Um, I think where people go wrong a lot on college campuses, when you think about mental health, the immediate response is going to how many mental health professionals do we have in the counseling center? Well, that's an important question. Um, and it certainly should be looked at. It, it, it is, if it's the only thing that one looks at, they're gonna, you're gonna lose. Uh, and it's not gonna be a trauma-informed um, approach. And I think it's missing a lot of the aspects of the mental health continuum uh, that you could be reaching. So those are some things. And also the last thing I would say is think about what your role and responsibility is on your campus. And where do you need to learn about um, trauma and what you can be doing and how you can support uh, to be part of a community of care that is trauma informed. Uh, and so that's where I will um, end that piece. So um, any other last comments, Tia and Sophia? We do have some questions. I wanted to get to those. Uh, if, let's see if you have anything else. Okay. So one of the questions is, how much is too much in what we provide to support the broad mental health needs of students? That's a good question. Anyone to take a stab at that? I have some I'm, thoughts, I'll let you go. <laughs> you know what, I'm gonna reiterate the admit what you can't do and be honest about that. And just let students know what you have available. Make sure that they know what it is. Because sometimes one thing I've seen is that students are not aware and we say things like, well, we told them during orientation you know how much information is coming at them? <laughs> so I remember, you know, trying to spread out some messaging and even um, repeating messaging so that, you know, three weeks in to a school year, four weeks in, eight weeks in, that you are continuously sharing what you do have to offer and what the um, resources are like, how to access them and do that often and in many different ways. Um, so that's one thought I have that sometimes there, you can never give too much information is how I feel. Um, and you can never give it in, in, in enough different modes. Some students do read their email. Some of them check Twitter. <laughs> Some of them check Instagram. So there, you have to now really think about the different modes of, of communication. And we now have technology that can make it much easier and detect at specific times and very smart, um, smartly timed and location-based. So there's a lot out there that you could do. Mm -hmm. yep. Tia, do you have any? Um, when I saw this question, when it when it popped up, I I just said, "Wow!" As a as a mother, as as someone who has, you know, nieces and nephews and and different things, I'm, I I just think to myself, if someone came to me and you know that they're suffering with a mental health need, I don't think anything is too much. I mean, I, I honestly think that that. Many of our students, we know um, from research, we know from data, since we were talking about this before, that the number one determining factor for student success, which has always been the same as a caring educator. And I think that uh, being expansive in what that means, and John, I'm so glad that you talked about that, that there are so many different people on our campuses that can provide and can direct our students to the services or to the support that they need. Not that they are actually giving it themselves, but can direct them to this. And I, I just I, I just hope as someone, and, and I know that you too feel the same way, that if someone came to you and, and wanted to have that and needed to have that type of support that we wouldn't turn them away, but we do have limitations. I mean, that we can't be everything to everyone, but but I think just acknowledging that, that trauma is on a, it's, 
on a spectrum, it's in different ways. And what are our resources? What can we provide? And oftentimes just having someone who cares and who listens and, and, and who can be there is something that will be a help to so many. And, and as you mentioned, and we talk about this in our book, Becoming a Student Ready College, the number one principle is everyone on campus has the capacity to be an effective educator. Mm -hmm. Every single person on the campus has a capacity to it. We don't all have the opportunity to do so. And how do we as an institution that wants to be trauma-informed provide the opportunity for everyone to serve in that role as a caring educator, knowing the impact it has on student success and their ability to thrive? Mm -hmm. And I guess the way I love this question um, and the way that I would uh, answer, and I've sort of said this already, is first of all, you have to think of mental health on a continuum. And it isn't about hiring more psychologists or social workers or mental health professionals only. It's about what is the programming you're offering? What about safe spaces on campus? We hear a lot about that a lot. That goes a long way and they mean a lot to students having safe spaces. Um, and so really understanding what you mean by mental health. And I encourage you to think about a mental health continuum. Secondly, building on what um, Sophia said, someone once said, and I don't know who it was, clarity is kindness. The, the more clear you can be about what you can and cannot offer, particularly mental health services, is so critical. I have seen over and over again in my career where families have felt um, sort of like a bait and switch, like they thought they would get all of their mental health services right on their campus or health services, whatever it might be. When we know that's not the case for every student for the whole time they're there, it just can't, it's not realistic. So what I encourage campuses to do, I think of like an expressway, there's multiple lanes. And so what you all need to do is carefully and thoughtfully and intentionally articulate what are the lanes and you stick to those lanes. And the whatever lanes you can, you just admit that you can't do that. Um, and so uh, pick your lane, stay in it or your lanes um, and really think of mental health on, on the continuum. And you'll be surprised actually a lot of things you're already do to come to bear on mental health. Um, the next question, um, you mentioned how these efforts need to be treated more as a cycle or process rather than a single event. Can you discuss what this continuous process should look like? Well, actually, I said that, but I, I'm not, I'm assuming you both agree with me. I don't know. <laughs> what do you all think? It's like, it's sort of like the whole issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion, too. I see that as a process. You have to constantly um, monitor and think about, you know, um, all of your programs, processes, and systems. And that may change. Realities change. Um, you know, whole things change. And so having a way strategically, um, having a part of a strategic process that doesn't just sit on a shelf, that really is a lived process, I think is really, really important. So that's my quick answer to that. I think of any, you know, cyclical process when you're doing any, not just strategic planning, but implementation. So you assess, you plan, you implement, you evaluate, you change, you plan, <laughs> you assess, you implement, you change. So it's always cyclical. And one thought I have about the cyclical nature is, the way that our students present themselves, right? So many do, if they're traditional students in the sense of quote unquote, I, I don't always like that term, but if you think of the four year thinking student that's coming out of high school is starting and they're probably gonna spend the four or five years and then they graduate and move on. There are some things that I've observed on some campuses where um, students might demonstrate and protest a specific policy or issue one year and someone who's been a leader there for 10 or 15, 20 years might say, oh, we did that already. We addressed that 10 years ago. Oh, guess what? Those students were not there. They don't care what you did 10 years ago with that issue because the issue is relevant and salient to them today. So in terms of cyclical, it's not like you should solve an issue and then put it on a shelf and say, well, we did that already. Things are changing, things change all the time. So I think thinking of everything as a cyclical nature is that's the way I think of it because that's traumatic when you're being told I don't really want to listen to your point of view on this issue because I feel like as an administrator I dealt with it already or I spent enough time solving the issue with whatever I had available at the time but just reframing that for yourself and not re-traumatizing new students who are now coming into an issue. Great. You have anything Tia that you'd like to add? 
Yeah, I, I think we spend a lot of time on the destination. We talk about this with TRH. We, we, with TRHT, we spend a lot of time on it and not on the process that we need to go through. And and I, and I don't mean the process and setting it up and preparing because that takes for some a long time as well. And we don't want to spend it on the process on how you actually put these systems and structures in place to support mental well-being and to actually support students that, that you know, have experienced racism or, you know, these instances on campuses and off campus and these injustices, which, you know, are too many to name. I think that we need to really focus on that process piece. And, and it is, it's something that we, we're still trying to understand in a deeper way in higher education, we're still struggling with. And I don't think we should be struggling with it. It's very clear. We have the data, we, our students tell us what they want to be done. I think it's our own culture that prohibits us. I mean, our, our inability to, we're, we're, we're sometimes we're slow to act in, in, in higher mm -hmm. education and we can't be that way. Um, and we can't wait for everyone to get on board either to, to act and to lead this work because it's not, that it's, it's probably never gonna happen because we all have our own funds of knowledge. We have our own experiences, our own backgrounds. And there are probably many people on campus and even on our own webinar that we did on TRHT just recently, someone said, one of the questions was about the ability to even engage in the work because leadership doesn't support it. And, and you mentioned that earlier, Sophia, the importance of leadership, that it's not something that is valued. Um, what we're our discussion today wouldn't be something that's valued, and, and it, that's hard to imagine in a in a place knowing where we are. But that's the reality that some people are, are are facing. So we can't wait for everyone to be engaged. The process has to be able to be sustained and move forward, even when there are some people that are not on board with us. And I and I think that that's sometimes a struggle at some institutions, and I know it is. Um, Tia, someone requested that you um, say again that, or write in chat the, the reference to the book that you talked about. Um, they wanted the title again. Oh, our book, Becoming a Student Ready College. Mm -hmm. okay. it's becoming, it was out in 2016. Okay. So I think we just have a couple more minutes and there's some great questions here and I, it's really hard. Um, I'm gonna take this one because real quickly, um, what would you suggest the differences in your approach to addressing trauma-informed work with graduate students, especially from a racial trauma lens? This is something I don't think graduate and professional students get enough attention sometimes in terms of the work we do. And so I really would like to just um, say that one. Um, if you have any thoughts on that, either one of you. John, you were talking about this in our prep session. So you should no. definitely say something okay. about this. You, you distinctly brought this up. <laughs> Well, I, I think, you know, um, the, the graduate and professional students, as I said, the focus always typically is on whether we mean it to be or not is on undergraduates. And so thinking about the unique needs and issues that graduate and professional students face, they're typically older, some may have families, um, and some uh, may be sacrificing a great deal to go back to graduate and professional school. So um, I would say that um, understanding what your specific graduate student needs are, are critical. I don't know as if all campuses do because a lot of the surveying and whatnot is done on undergraduates. So getting to know what those needs are, that may be an area where you do have to collect some data um, and do some focus groups in particular. Um, and then, uh, you know, thinking about um, what the particular uh, developmental issues are for graduate and professional students in terms of their journey. Um, there's not a lot of writing on this actually, and not a lot of data. And that's really unfortunate. And I hope that this is an area where more um, thought can go into and more research goes into um, to really understand it. So that's my thinking on it. Um, I don't know if I have anything big, but uh, that's I would my like thought. to add a quick thought on that. Um, I think we have developed a culture of care for undergraduate students in a way that, you know, I haven't seen in the but we don't have not done the same for graduate students. And I think there's still a culture of rite of passage. It was hard for me, so it's gonna be hard for you. And you know, I remember having a conversation with a faculty member who was mentoring doctoral students and said, oh, it's so much easier now because there's so much easier access to data and information. You know, Back in college, I was putting things on microfiche and printing out all this stuff and going to a library. 
And now you can click and get everything you need and crowdsource articles. The thing is, the synthesis of the articles, the analysis and writing it is still a need and mentorship is still needed and support is still needed. So it's actually not any easier because now you have information overload. So it's a different issue. So again, just creating that culture of care for grad students as much as we've done for undergrads. So I'm, I'm with you, John. I think there's a lot more. There is research, by the way, about grad students, but I think, again, we're not listening to it or, or reading about it. So I think we should, and I think there definitely should be more information about creating that culture of care and well-being for grad students. I completely now, agree, and I can't believe, Sophia, Sophia, you just said microfiche. People are probably like, what is that? I don't even know what that is. I don't, I don't know what that is. And that's intentionally why we featured a post, a, a doctoral student on our panel for our webinar last week on TRHT. Well, the week before that, because we, we just said we have to show that our students, the trauma and the need to, to heal and dealing with racism is not something that just happens in the undergraduate student population. So, yes, completely agree. And, and you I took me back, I Sophia. Myself. I dated <laughs> you took me back. You took us back. No, you dated us all. You took us back. Thank you. <laughs> you know, and I would, uh, I would add, and it sort of bleeds into one of the other questions about how do you engage faculty. You know, one of the things that I really think is critical is, is, is more um, uh, training and discussions with uh, uh, research mentors and, and leads and departments and, and whatnot. And, you know, one of the things I found very helpful in engaging faculty was really developing close relationships with the, the faculty senate presidents, um, as well as the provost, who typically is the chief academic officer on college campuses. That's where you really get the buy-in and make it a priority. So um, thank you. Well, I think we're, our time is up and I really wanna thank you Tia and Sophia for this great discussion. And I hope, again, I wanna thank, I hope that everyone in the audience felt it was helpful. Um, if we didn't answer your question, we'll try to get to them. Hopefully we can keep a copy of that. And I wanna again, thank Dr. Trump for, and her colleagues at um, Boise State University for inviting us and uh, have a good day. <laughs>